Thank you so much for being here today. We have an important subject to talk about today. We're going to continue the series that we have been in over the last few weeks, answering questions. Uh, do you ever ask why? Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about saved from what? We're going to be discussing this whole idea of what it means to be a follower of Christ, what it means to be saved, to be born again. You might hear people talk about it a lot. Maybe you've heard about it so much that you don't even really think about it anymore. But today, we're going to revisit uh, for some or visit for the first time, what it means to have a personal relationship with Jesus. Um, I went to jail this week. Did anybody else go to Eastside night? No, no I'm kidding. I didn't go to jail at Eastside night. I just was trying to catch you with your hand up. Then uh, I didn't go to jail at the fair, but I went to jail this week um, and uh, hadn't been before. I got to ride with a police officer in our church uh, the other day, this last week, and um, he took a, a guy to jail, so I got to go. And um, when we went into jail, I was uh, overwhelmed with a couple things. Now, I had been around, visited people before, but this was a different sort of a process. Um, we walked in uh, to, or drove into a garage, the door locked behind us. We walked up to a door and somebody looked at us through a camera, opened the door, we went in and then they locked it behind us. We're standing in a little tiny little area and then we're looking at a camera and then they open a door and then we walk through another area and a door locks behind us. And me, I'm not even that claustrophobic. I started realizing how stuck I was and how I wasn't getting out of this place until somebody who's sitting at a computer screen behind this camera decides that I can get out if I want to. And um, the finality of being stuck uh, started to stress me out a little bit, you know, and I'm kind of looking around going, they don't even have an emergency exit in this place, you know, push the button and, or the bar and the alarm will sound. And, and then I thought about two things. One was that I got to leave in a few minutes. And two, that there were some people who were there who couldn't leave no matter what, that they had no more choices. Their choices were over and their freedom was gone. So what I'm gonna be talking to you about today is the fact that right now you have unlimited choices to come or go if you want to. That right now you have the freedom to choose whether or not you wanna follow Christ or whether you don't want to. But at some point in time, our choices, our freedom is gone. For some, the Bible says the heart is hardened to the point where you just don't hear, don't care about the message anymore. And it's just not important to you. For all of us, death is the deciding factor, the final time, where when we leave this biological life behind, what we've decided about Christ is the only and most important decision that we've ever made. And so it's critically important while we still have the ability to choose, while we still have the freedom to come and to go, not to come and go, you know, literally, but you get my meaning with my analogy or my story, it's important to consider it. So we're gonna talk about it this morning and I hope you're ready to talk about it. It's kind of like right now, um, go into the mall. If you go to the mall and you walk down the bottom floor of the mall, you're gonna walk past some perfume counters at the mall. And if you make eye contact with the person who's working there, they're gonna come out and they're gonna start trying to sell you something. And so the whole point of walking down toward Dillard's in the mall is not making eye contact with anybody because if you do, you can get through unscathed. Um, I don't want you to fall into that trap this morning where you feel like maybe this is a message where if you just don't make eye contact with God or me or somebody else, you can just get through without thinking about it. I want you to let it land this morning, not to scare you, but so that you can consider the reality of your personal relationship with Jesus, whether or not you have decided to follow Christ or um, where you stand with that. And it's an honest conversation. It's an important conversation. It's one I want you to take your time with until you're sure. But once you're sure, I don't want you to take any more time than you need because you never know. And I love you and most of us have been together for a long time. And you know, I would never try to scare you into any emotional decision. It's not my style, my preference. I can't stand stuff like that. But it is important to me to be honest and it's important to me to tell you the truth. And so we're gonna dive into that today. And I wanna pray for you quickly as we get started. Father, as we talk about this, give us ears to hear the truth, eyes to see, and a heart that's sensitive to respond if need be. I pray it simply, but expecting your power and your strength in Jesus' name, amen. So Genesis, in Genesis, we all messed it up. 
We were created by God, not we, but Adam and Eve to carry out God's rule on earth. Now, we don't have a lot of time to talk about it, but the reason Adam and Eve were created was that they were to have dominion over the earth. They were to be in charge and to sort of delegate or for God to delegate his rule. And um, the cool thing about the way that Adam and Eve were created is they didn't have any sin. The cloud that exists, the brain fog, the spirit fog, where we're not able to really experience God the way that he intended for us to experience him. Adam and Eve experienced him with their senses. They were able to hear God, to hear Jesus walking in the garden, to speak, to physically be around and enjoy his presence. And that's the purpose that they and we we were created for. Well, you probably know the story. People rebelled. There were a lot of firsts in the garden. Satan entered the garden in the form of a serpent. And there was the first deception, the first distortion of God's word. It was the first time humans, Adam and Eve, decided that they may want to choose a plan other than God's. He had told them that they could have anything they wanted in the entire garden except fruit from the tree of good and evil. But yet that's what Eve chose. Adam chose very quickly to follow along. And God cursed them because... He could not abide with sin. His holiness and his justice caused God to levy consequences, not just on Adam and Eve, but on the human race. And so God cast Adam and Eve out of the garden, posted an angel at the gate or the entrance so they could never return and told us some things in Genesis that were true about them and unfortunately true about us. That there would be a curse, sin, passed down from father and mother to son and daughter and father and mother to son and daughter and father and mother to son and daughter. That everyone is born and born sinful in separation from God, that everybody is born with a sinful nature, with that brain fog, with that spirit cloudiness, not able to really even understand or, or sense who God is. The Bible says in, in Ephesians chapter two, that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. How dead? A hundred percent dead. For years and years and years and years and years, humans lived with the weight of that curse because God was just, because he was holy but God was also loving and merciful. And so he began to hint. The hints became more of a thread. The thread became a storyline. The storyline became the point, a savior that would come, that would reconcile humanity to himself, that would reverse the curse, that would allow all of us who were born destined for separation from God in an eternity in an active place of punishment called hell the ability to choose Jesus and to spend eternity in heaven. But for many, many years, people lived with a law that proved that they were unable to be right with God. People many times think you can be good enough to uh, go to heaven when we die. I don't know if you've ever heard anybody that said that, or maybe you think that. When polled, Americans, most Americans, if they believe in heaven, believe they're gonna go there. And when you ask them why, they say, well, I'm a pretty good person. Pretty good. Matter of fact, um, I do more good things than I do bad things. And I'm sure God's gonna let me in because after all, there's all these, and then they list all the really bad people. And they say, surely I'm gonna make it, you know, but you don't really know. And the problem with that is, is that if it takes being good to get into heaven, then God himself is not good because God didn't give us the instructions on how good we have to be. You can read the Bible for years and years and years to try to figure out how good is good and you're not going to find it because it's not in there. So how in the world would a good God not even tell us what's good enough? And the conundrum is that good has nothing to do with it, but it was all that people could do. So they grasped it and tried to perfect it and ruined it which is kind of where we pick up our story today. God's plan for redemption, for peace between man and himself, men and women, came through his son, Jesus. And in John chapter three, we read about a story of a man named Nicodemus who was trying to wrap his mind around the fact that he couldn't be born into the right family and get into heaven. And boy, trust me, he was born into the right family 
that he could not have the right experiences. Didn't really matter how many times he'd been to church or how many Bible passages he knew and get into heaven. Didn't even matter how good he was because being good and good enough wasn't gonna get him into heaven because Nicodemus, he held on to these things and he believed that's all that it took. And not only is that what he believed, but he was a group of 6,000 Pharisees at the time of Jesus who, who taught this to people and said, you gotta be good. How good? Really good. Well, how good's really good? Well, we'll tell you. And if you're not, we'll let you know. It was a religious system that choked the life, the love, the freedom, and the joy out of the people who Jesus had come to free, to love, and to give joy. Nicodemus was a man who was a leader of the Pharisees, as you will see in just a couple of minutes, who came to Jesus and wanted to have a conversation with Jesus about what it took to be right with God. So we pick up in John 3, after Jesus was born, had lived about 30 something years, 30 and change, had lived a perfect life, 100% God and 100% man, had never done anything even close to sin, had begun his ministry for three years at the end of his life to gather anyone who would listen and share with them the good news of the gospel that sin could be forgiven, the curse could be reversed, and heaven could be guaranteed for anyone who put their faith and trust in Christ alone. So to understand John 3, you have to understand John 2. And John 2 it has a lot of fragmented sort of stories in it. I want more information. I've told you before, I wish that I could sit down with the authors of scripture who were inspired by the Holy Spirit as they wrote these things and ask for more detail. I want more detail. When you read John chapter two, you see Jesus doing his first miracle, really important miracle. Then you see Jesus driving people out of the temple who turned the temple into a mockery. Then you see this, uh, these, these vague statements Jesus makes about, you wanna know that I'm the son of God? Tear the temple down, I'll rebuild it in three days. And they're like, what are you talking about? It took 40 years to build the temple. And then there's just this little tiny statement that's made in John chapter two, verse 24, that says many people people had seen the signs and wonders that Jesus did and they believed in Jesus. But Jesus, knowing the hearts of people, didn't believe in their belief. And then there's an ellipsis, not in scripture, just in my mind and my understanding, a pregnant pause as we turn the page and we go to chapter three. And by the way, when scripture was inspired by God and written by human authors, there were no numbers and chapters and book names. It was just letters stories, truth. We pick it up in verse one. You guys ready to pick it up? I'm trying to read you guys and see if you're still with me and some of you are blocked in the light. So I'm gonna come down here and check it out for myself. Uh, what I'm asking for is some body language, a little, you know, just a little yeah, leaning in and that, that's good. Okay, I'm happy now. I'll go back up into the light. John chapter three, verse one, just had to make sure we're all together. Now there was a Pharisee. See, I told you a man named Nicodemus who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, which was like the Supreme Court of the Jews. He was policymaker. He was politic decider. I mean, he was like the chief of the chief of the Jewish people. Now, almost certainly he was part of the group in John chapter two, who'd witnessed the, thing, the things that Jesus had done, who said, I believe, but Jesus said, no, you don't. You don't really believe, but we're making progress. He was a member of the Jewish ruling council and he came to Jesus at night and he said, Rabbi, and should I stop here? and just let you know that it makes no difference why he came at night. There's some folks that say, Nicodemus came at night, so he was ashamed. Maybe Nicodemus came at night because he didn't wanna lose his job or his life, possibly. Nicodemus came at night because his wife had a long to-do list and he couldn't get you know, free during the day. Maybe, maybe Jesus' schedule was so busy and Nicodemus said, hey, I'd like a minute with you. And he's great, come after dinner, we'll hang out. We don't know, but sometimes people make a lot out of that and there's just not a lot to be made out of that. He came to Jesus at night and he said, teacher or rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who's come from God. Now he says this right here, we know. He's speaking for a group of religious people who had been good and they'd made good a professional sport, who'd been born into the right family, who'd been around church and 
Christianity for their entire lives, who knew more Bible verses, could quote more prayers. I mean, they'd taken it so far, way, way far, too far. I shared with you last week how far some of them took it, but I wanna remind you with a few more examples. Nicodemus was the kind of dude that on the Sabbath, and they had 65 different laws for keeping the Sabbath, which is their day of worship. He wouldn't look in a mirror. The Pharisees wouldn't look in a mirror on the Sabbath uh, because he might see a gray hair. And if he did, he would pluck it out, which would be considered work. And if you worked on the Sabbath, it was sin. They would not eat the egg that came out of a chicken on the Sabbath unless they killed the chicken because the chicken had worked on the Sabbath. And if they killed the chicken for working on the Sabbath, then they could eat the egg and somehow, I mean, these guys were like professional rule keepers. And yet here he is with Jesus saying, look at my resume, my pedigree, my seminary degrees. I mean, when I go into the marketplace, I, I, I drop and pray two times a day. I know this, I know that, I've been here, I've been there. Do you know who my parents are? And he's coming to Jesus and Jesus is speaking to him. And um, Nicodemus says, hey, you know, we know the signs you've been performing and God's probably with you. Now, I think there's a long conversation here. I don't know that for sure, but I want you to just remember with me how this transpires. This is John who probably witnessed this between Jesus and Nicodemus, if not was told about it, but it's John witnessing it in real time, but writing about it years later. Does that make sense? So he's seeing it and then he's going, oh yeah. And the Holy Spirit of course is reminding him and, and giving him words, but he's remembering something that happened years and years before. So he's hitting the pertinent highlights of the story, right? But he's not sitting there with a pen writing down every single word. So we're not getting every single, you know, nuance of this conversation, which again, I wish we were, because I, I think Jesus probably who was courteous would have said, well, thank you very much for the compliment, but there's something else I wanna talk about. It's not in scripture. We don't know for sure. It just seems like there's more to the story here. And Jesus replied, maybe he read his mind. Maybe he just knew what he was thinking. And he said, Nicodemus, verily, verily, I tell you, nobody can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Have you ever heard the terms born again? Anyone? I was born in 1969 and started becoming aware of life and my surroundings in the 70s. By the time the late 70s had come and the early 80s were here, being born again had been turned into a slogan that was thrown around in ways that were shameful. It was on bumper stickers, it was on t-shirts, it was confusing and it was weird. Because when you say born again to somebody who's not a believer with no context, it sounds really out of left field, doesn't it? I mean, it doesn't sound like it communicates what God had in mind at all because we made it weird, not because it was weird, because it wasn't at all. And the word again here, by the way, means from above. So what we're reading here is that Jesus is saying, if you wanna be part of the kingdom, you've gotta put all of your stuff. I mean, thanks for being good. Thanks for keeping the law. Wish you hadn't made it what you did, but maybe you started off with the right intentions. Put all that aside, be born again. One more time, Ephesians 2, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Just like you had no ability to be born the first time, you have no ability to be born the second time. Someone else has to birth you. Now, the apostle Paul, who was also a Pharisee, talked about this process like an adoption where the work has been done, the paperwork has been signed by God and that we have to choose whether or not we're gonna step up and sign our side of the agreement. But a person who's dead, who's spiritually dead, who must be born again from above, has to have the Holy Spirit of God, God himself, whisper an invitation into that person's ear or spirit. Now, I believe it happens to every single person who lives and ever has lived at least one time. Some people don't believe that, but I do. And I believe that you have the ability to accept or to reject that invitation. 
And I think that sometimes that invitation or the desire you have, the interest, the eyes to see your ears to hear, sometimes that comes over and over and over and over and over. And for some people, God allows the heart to harden and it never comes again. Now we're walking through the mall and we're approaching the perfume counter. Don't look away. These are things we need to look at. We need to allow to land. I don't want you to be sure, but they're hard truths. So Jesus is laying this on Nicodemus and keep in mind to Nicodemus's credit, Jesus is talking about an event here in a minute that's going to happen, his death, burial and resurrection. It hasn't happened yet. So Nicodemus is trying to figure it out. John still trying to figure it out. Jesus continuing with the process. In verse four, which I skipped just for sake of time and space, Nicodemus says, how can I crawl back into my mom's belly and get born again? And Jesus is like, ha ha, that's funny. He said, verily, verily, I tell you, nobody can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and of spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, Nicodemus, but the spirit of God gives birth to you, a new spirit. You shouldn't be surprised at me saying you must be born again. The wind, the pneuma, the Holy Spirit goes wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it goes. Now, these are a lot of words and this is what it means. Nicodemus, you thought that salvation was only for the Jews, only for the good people, only for the people who you think deserve salvation. The Holy Spirit is not limited by your expectations, your stipulations, or even your definition of good. You aren't in control. and you must be born again. So Nicodemus, that's a thinker for him. Everything that he had done to ensure that he had God trapped into a contract for him to enter heaven, Jesus was saying, none of it is good enough. And this was a guy who was really good at being good. Let's continue. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. In just a few short months, just a couple of years, after Jesus' interaction with Nicodemus, Jesus allowed himself to be arrested, allowed himself to be tried, and allowed himself to be crucified because the debt that Adam and Eve started and the debt that we have all accrued, and if you're honest, contributed to, some of us better than others and some of us more often than others, but all of us contributed to it, it had to be paid for the work to be done for God to sign the adoption contract. And Jesus, in fact, did that. And he rose from the dead three days later, defeating sin, Satan, and death once and for all so that the gospel is truly good news. Now, we're going to come back in a few minutes and we're going to talk about that. And most importantly, I'm going to tell you how to make absolutely sure that you're a follower of Christ so that you can leave here at peace with God, with peace in your soul and looking forward to what comes next. So we'll pick up kind of where we left off. And um, as I was sitting over there on the front row, just kind of thinking and praying about how best to communicate this, how best to finish this message, I f I'm frustrated because words just don't do a great job. I mean, it's like, um, it reminds me of my granddaughter, Emery, who's learning words and learning to say them um, in succession and quickly. Sometimes she has so much she wants to say, she just babbles. It's like, blah, 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 blah. And then she grabs your face and makes sure you're paying attention. And that's how I feel almost, that it's like so important. I just wanna grab your face and make sure you're paying attention, but I just don't wanna babble. I want you to get this. So let's review. And this is the Christian story. This is what Christians believe. Many people will tell you part of it. Um, many teach away from certain aspects of it, but I love you. And so I'm gonna tell you the truth and you can decide whether online or here, what you wanna do with it. There was original sin and there was a punishment because of that original sin. And there was a curse placed on all humankind. 
The Bible teaches that every person born from the time of Adam and Eve until today and through today was born sinful and deserving of an eternity in hell. The Bible says that we were spiritually dead with no ability to respond whatsoever. How dead? Entirely dead, like a dead person, unable to respond, no ability within ourselves to come back to life. As we are spiritually dead, God, through Jesus Christ, provided the way for us to be spiritually alive, but impossible for us to respond without an invitation from God himself through the Holy Spirit. So from time to time, sometimes often, sometimes perhaps not, a person who does not know Jesus will be spiritually interested There'll be something in you, something drawing you, something piquing your curiosity, almost like you feel a magnet drawn toward truth. And a person has the responsibility whether to choose to lean in or to lean out. And some people get very good at leaning out. Sometimes we shout down the voice of God putting in place our own compassion. Well, how could a good God do the things he does? Our logic, certainly there are other ways to get to heaven. Our own good behavior, well, you wouldn't discount all of the great things that I've done in my life. And continues to derail our own train toward truth because in our minds, we can't reconcile what it is that intuitively we know must be true. But when a person chooses to lean in, and acknowledge the fact that we were born sinful, that we have sinned and fallen short of God's glory, that our just reward is hell, but the free gift of God is an eternal life and a purpose and a peace and a love. And we choose to confess our sin and we choose to believe who Jesus is and we choose to become his follower, then we've stepped up to the desk and signed the adoption papers and what needed to be done can now never be undone. There's a friend of mine in our church who was older. When I say older, that means older than me. Um, he was in his seventies and uh, came to church after having been out of church for a long, long time, left when he was 13 because he was judged by the church or felt judged by the church. He had no use for the rules, no use for the people who said he didn't belong there. So he decided God must be that kind of God. And he left for a long time. You do the math, 13 to 70 something, that's a long time to be upset at God and upset at the church. So he came through the invitation of a friend and for some reason by his own admission, he came back and he didn't know why. Don't like church, don't really like preachers, not really that interested, but I'm gonna come back. And he came back again and he came back again and he came back again and pretty soon he came back like he was part of the church family. Had no idea if he was a follower of Christ or not. One day he called me to his house. He said, hey, we gotta talk. He's old school, he wasn't gonna text. He certainly wasn't gonna talk on the phone. So we sat down and we talked and he said, I'm in. I'm a follower of Christ. I've decided to give my life to Jesus. And he said, I have peace with God. I hadn't had peace with anybody in 75 years. And he said, now what? Because see, I believe that God's created you for a purpose. And I believe that this year has been a year where we have dedicated ourselves as a church family to letting God transform us, to change us, so that he can continue to reveal his purpose for us individually and as, as a church family. He said, I'm not dead and I don't know why. What do I do now? Because God clearly has something for me. And I said, tell me about your people. And he said, uh-oh, <laughs> okay, so let's talk. And he said, well, he said, I wasn't a real good dad the last uh, few decades. And he had some good reasons, but they weren't good enough. And he said, I broke a lot of relationships along the way. And he said, I have no idea how in the world I could ever undo that. And I said, well, maybe that's your purpose. And he said, well, you talk about miracles preacher, but if that happens, that'll be a miracle. 
So we started to pray about it together. He sent some text messages, which was against his nature, but much more consistent with his family's communication style. Over time, received some invitations, earned some influence. Three years later, at Christmas, he showed me pictures on his phone of his grandkids who he had reconciled with and been invited to Christmas with for the first time in over 20 years. And I talked to him and said, now what? And he said, what do you mean now what? He said, now they need to know about Jesus. Now they need the same peace that I have. He was at peace with God. Then he began to make peace with his past. He began to make peace with others. He was discovering his purpose. And as I watched him develop in just three, three and a half years, he was becoming a man of God after hating God and hating God's church. I got a text message not too long ago that he had fallen, hit his head, and he was dead. No choices left for this man. But he had made the most important decision a person could ever make. He'd chosen to accept the free gift of eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And not only that, but he began to discover his purpose through this peace that God had given him. And when I got the message that he had died, I'll be honest with you, I didn't have any sadness at all because I got to watch a man finish well. And I knew without any question the first Sunday that I was here and he wasn't, that he's there. And he understands the reality that I'm so trying so hard to communicate to you today. But it's a choice. You have a life that God has entrusted to you. And only you can choose to give yourself to Jesus. Your mom and dad can't do it for you. If I could do it for you, I would have done it a long time ago. You have to choose. And to choose, it really just involves three sort of understanding agreements that we make with God. I've alluded to them before, but I want to tell you now as we conclude. The first one is we have sinned and we've blown it and we can't reconcile with God. The second one is Jesus paid the price and I believe in Jesus and believe that he is all I need. The third one is that I want my life to be a life of God's purpose, not mine. And as you show me, I'll follow. And you can tell that to God any way you want to tell it to him because God's installed in you the ability to think thoughts that only he can hear. So when you address your thoughts to God, he's like, yep, I've been waiting to hear from you. He got it. He hears. He communicates with you. He's waiting. Some people call it prayer. It's just thinking a thought toward God. And the thought that you think toward God might go something like this. Without understanding this, without coming to peace with this, the rest of the fall won't make a lot of sense to you. Because to be able to grow as a child of God, we have to be a child of God. So this is a way that you could do that. A thought that you could think. God, I know that I have sinned. I deserve hell. But I believe that Jesus Christ took the punishment that I deserve so that through my, my faith in him, I could be forgiven. With your help, I put my trust in you for salvation. Thank you for your grace, because I don't deserve it, and your forgiveness, because I've blown it, and for this free gift that you've given me of eternal life. And when you, when you tell God that's what you want and that's who you are, then he immediately takes his Holy Spirit and seals the deal by supernaturally putting his Holy Spirit within you, your spirit, and your salvation can never be revoked. You go from darkness to light, from death to life, from old to new, from damned 
to free in one supernatural instant. And friends, if this is true, which I believe it is, it's the only thing that matters. So what are you gonna do? Father, thank you so much for the time that we've spent today. And I love my friends, Father, but you love them far more than I could. And I've done my best to be clear, to tell them the truth, but my best is not good enough. So I'm trusting that you, through the power of your Holy Spirit, will just speak to my friends clearly. That they would have the eyes to be able to see and the ears to be able to hear the truth that comes from your word, the courage to respond, and the desire to embrace not just a different way, but a brand new way of life and living. where they no longer have to be in fear of the moment when their freedom is gone and they have no more choices. But like my friend, when this life is gone, having made the only choice that matters with the joy and the peace of heaven to come. I'm so excited about us turning the corner this fall and finishing this year well. And Father, the reason for a day like today is so that we can be on the same page, on your page, becoming men and women of God, discovering and fulfilling our purpose for your glory and yours alone. In Jesus' name, amen.